Okay. Uh, I think we are live and we are here uh, with Judy Weeks Rohner. Excited to have you here this evening for our Salt Lake County GOP Thursday. Uh, let's see, I'm hearing an echo. Let me. We, I think we need okay. to Okay. I think I fixed the uh, I fixed the echo. It was coming from my end, so no worry there. Um, it's great to have you here. We're here for our Thursday town hall series. Um, and we want to welcome everybody joining on YouTube and Facebook tonight. Um, throughout the night, if you have questions for either of our candidates, we invite you to go on to YouTube and ask those questions. I have the, uh, the Q&A pulled up here. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to put them there and we'll make sure that the candidates have a chance to address those. Um, <clears throat> and just a reminder that these events are made possible through your donations as uh, members of the Republican Party here in, in, the, in the county. So um, we, we thank you for your donations and invite you to continue uh, making those donations to make events like this possible. Um, so again, we're, we're excited to have Judy Weeks Rohner here tonight, candidate for House District 30. Um, and Judy, wanted to have you just give a little bit of a background about yourself. Maybe tell us where District 30 is and then just tell us why you decided to, to run. Oh, thank you first for having us here. That's really great. And I appreciate the time. I'm, of course, Judy Weeks Rohner, and I represent District 30, which is basically West Valley City. It runs from 56 West to 32nd West, 47 South to 3500 South. So it's a nice rectangle and uh, it's, it's a wonderful place to live. And it's a wonderful opportunity to represent the people of that area. I am, uh, I grew up in Wyoming. I'm a farm girl, so I used to hard work. I used to um, do things, you know, on the farm, just like everybody else. We raised potatoes, uh, the whole nine yards. And um, when I came to Utah working for US West in 1983, and since that time, I have devoted myself to my community and to make it better. And not only my community, but my state also. This is home. I've raised my only son here and I have two grandchildren that I hope that they stay here in Utah and that they're able to raise their families whenever they decide to get married, but not too soon. They, they, can, they can wait a little while, okay? I want them to get their, their education. They're both in college and they need to finish that first. Oh, wonderful. And why I ran, decided to run, it was um, people asking me to do it. And I, I told them, oh, you guys, you know, I don't think you, you know uh, what you really want. Go get, find somebody else. And they kept coming back and saying, no, Judy, we want you to do it. So I said, okay, I'll give it a try. And I'm up at the legislature now and I'm hoping that I can do something to make my community better and to do something for this state. Well, thank you. Um, and just, you, you mentioned your family and I'd love to have you tell us a little bit about what bills you might support that would help protect Utah families. Uh, well, in 2019, uh, the Utah Re legislature, just before Christmas, they gave the citizens of Utah, a Christmas present, and it was called SB 2001. And they said it was going to be a tax refund and all this kind of jargon. And it turns out that it would have raised the tax on food 2.78%, would have been uh, 10 cents a gallon more on gas, and services would have had to increase. Well, uh, myself and four other people decided to sign what they called a referendum to be able to open it up to the citizens of Utah. And I'm talking about everybody, not just a certain particular thing. This was a ground roots organization that we went to Harmon stores, uh, all different places and collected signatures to repeal SB 2001. On January 28th in 2020, the Utah legislature they appeal, repealed that bill. So today, 
looking at the way inflation is. Had we not done that, can you imagine? I mean, right now we're paying $5 for a carton of eggs. Add 2.78% to that. Look at the gas, uh, almost $5. Add 10 cents a gallon to that. That's what the citizens of this state did is they stopped it. The only thing is we have not repealed the tax on food and we need to do that. And we're not doing it just because of the poor. We're doing it because of the working people, the average everyday citizen in the state. They go to the store generally once a week and they see that slip and they see that tax. And yes, there are people that espouse to an income tax. That's once a year and it's nothing like having it done. And you know, we have a lot of money and 70 years ago, the citizens of Utah were promised that it would only be in a short amount of time. And that hasn't happened. They've stopped the sunset law and now it's, it's a daily thing. It needs to stop. The mm. people of Utah deserve better. States around us do not have a food tax. And it's only 1% of the budget. We can, we, we can do it. Don't ever let anybody tell you that it's impossible because the Utah way is getting it done. Well, thank you. And, and I'm curious, what are some of the barriers to repealing the food tax? I, I, it's interesting to know that it's been around for, for 70 years and it was originally framed as, as something temporary. Why is it that it has stuck around so long and, and what are some of those barriers to, to doing away with it? Well, it's, it's a permanent thing. So where it's steady, they know that it's, that income is going to come in and it's gonna come in generally at a certain rate and it's there forever. Whereas other taxes are fluent and this one is stable and people don't like to, well, I should not say people, the majority of the citizens in Utah have told the legislators repeatedly that they want this removed. And the legislators' leadership needs to listen to the people. And this is not just the only thing that people have voiced their concern about. This is the thing that has brought me back into the arena. I used to serve on the Granite School Board and was concerned about how money was being spent on education. That's still my concern. But looking at it a holistic, there's, we need to get the money for the food, we need uh, our public policy for safety. There's so much that we can do, we should be doing, and we need to listen to our constituents. Oh, well, thank you. Um, and, and as we're talking about uh, the, the financial burden that Utah families face, um, there's one part of your campaign or something that you are passionate about uh, from what we've talked about is, is small business. Can you tell us about what your what you're doing to help support small businesses in in your district? Uh, it's not just my district; it's statewide. Mm -hmm. We have, with the pandemic, uh, people were told to go to the the larger shops, the WalMarts, the Home Depots, those type of things, and it made our small businesses go under or barely make it. So what I do is I go out, I find these businesses, I do stories on them with Judy's Corner, and we try to encourage people to go to these places and shop, eat there, uh, give these people good tips, um, make whatever we can do to make those businesses stable. Our economy is based upon the ma and pa operations. We cannot afford to let them go under. It's critical. And people need to understand that when you go into a place that's owned by a, a resident of your community, that money stays in your community. Those taxes then are reinvested and it builds up our economy. Uh, 
I know the other day I was at a place called Tasty's, a business that's been in business for 27 years, and he doesn't know if he's going to make it this next year. Uh, the cost of supplies have gone up dramatically. So he's forced to pay it, and then he has to pass it on to the people that come in. Uh, he's got uh, a couple of kitchens that um, these food trucks come into. Well, if he goes under those food trucks and all the businesses that he sponsors, they go, they'll have to go under too, or find someplace else to go and get their food. Yeah. It's uh, a cyclical thing and it can be done if when you're looking at going shopping and you're going to eat at a restaurant, first thing, try those mom and pa operations. And to be perfectly honest, their food's probably even better than the others. <laughs> just, just telling you. Yeah, yeah, I've I've often found that to be the case. Um, and I'm curious, what what is in the power of the legislature right now, or what what bills might be um, under consideration that could help small business that that, that you might support? Well, I'm going to support anything that will keep a uh, small business open and to stop some of the regulation that small businesses have to face. We need to allow these businesses to operate uh, safely and soundly, but make it so where they uh, do less restrictions and open up the free market like this country was born with. Uh, we also, uh, we, I put through the food tax bill again, and I'm asking everybody that's listening Contact your local representative and ask them to support the bill. It's not numbered yet, so I don't know what it's going to be, but uh, food tax is important. We're only removing the state portion of the food tax, and that's all we're doing, not, not anything else. And we have a large amount of money that, that's uh, available, so we're not, a, we're not poor. We're we can afford to do the uh, food tax. Yeah, uh, and, and another one of the, your priorities in your campaign and, and in your uh, time in office has been public safety. And I'm wondering what you've heard from your constituents, people um, in, the, in, the, in your district, uh, what are their concerns regarding public safety and, and what is something that you are interested in doing to try to address those concerns? First and foremost, we need to support our local police departments. Uh, they're out, they're there to protect and serve us. And we need to do everything we can. And I do not espouse to defunding the police. I want to support our police officers, give them the best tools. I want them to be able to be trained properly. I want the, the constituents to feel safe, to know their police department, and embrace the things that they're doing. That's what I hear, safety, what we're, we're tired of vandalism, we're tired of uh, the lack of personal safety when we go different places. Uh, so the support of the police department is paramount uh, to, uh, the, to the community. Once you have a, a good working police department, your citizens feel safe, and then that allows them to do more with the community and they get out more and they help one another then. When you're able to leave your house and you know you're, you're safe, that your house is not gonna be burglarized, uh, your car is not gonna be uh, you know, vandalized, you go out and you start helping your neighbor, you start doing other things. And that's what happens when you have a strong police department that works with the community and your constituents feel safe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Building that, building that trust uh, between uh, the legislature and, and the department, I think seems like a really valuable approach. Well, and, you, and I really believe that we need to have trust between our constituents and to the legislators and to our city government. Um, I believe walking uh, talking to people like I have been, there is a real lack of trust. And we need to build that back up. This country was built by people working together and understanding that 
we all have different values and uh, come from different economic, social skills. But one thing about it is this is America and we care about our country and we wanna do what's best for the USA, for Utah and our own local communities. We want to have a good education system. We want to be able to have our children stay in Utah. This is, this is what I fight for. This is what I want for my constituents. This is what I want for my neighbors uh, that are in Utah County that are all over. A, a legislator is supposed to represent their area, but they also uphold the Constitution of Utah and the Constitution of the United States. So that means we care about everything, not just focused in on one little tiny thing. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned staying in Utah. I know this is something that many you know, parents, as their kids get older, they think, hey, are my kids even going to be able to afford to stay in Utah, to, to buy a house someday, like, like they had the opportunity to and so I'm, I'm curious that this is part of this broader issue with growth in Utah. Obviously, it brings a lot of economic prosperity, but it also brings with it a number of challenges. I'm wondering what your approach would be to solve some of those challenges yeah, with growth in Utah. I think that we need to have controlled growth. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to have uh, people being able to have jobs that they can afford an apartment, to afford a house. And we need to do that by lowering some different things. We need controlled growth. It, the inflation rate and everything has just gone bonkers. And it needs to be, we, we need to pull back. You know, uh, each individual, when you look at your budget, you live within that budget and the normal family can't go out and raise taxes and do all the things that a city, county, or a state can do. And we need to put ourselves back into that position and lower things and get things organized so where everybody, that, um, that our children can stay here in Utah and that they get a good education. That's so important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know as, as my... Some of my nieces and nephews are getting to that age where they're they're starting to move out of the house and trying to see if they can live here. So um, I think that's it's really really important consideration. Well, and I think there's so many uh, families now where the children are staying longer and longer and longer in the houses, and sometimes the parents want the kids out, but they can't because it's impossible. And we've got I know some people in my area are working two and three jobs and. Unfortunately, their children are working jobs and not going to school, and we need to stop that. We need to bring things back into control, and we need to start thinking about our family, basic units of how we're going to feed them, a, a roof over their head, lowering their taxes. Uh, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, and, and absolutely. And speaking of protecting families, we have a question from someone on YouTube. Craig Foster asks, what will you do to help put more teeth in the Utah law that is supposed to keep porn out of the schools? Uh, that's House Bill 374, and we need to work on that. We need to um, actually make sure that all local school districts are making sure that uh, if there is pornography in the schools that it's out, we need to have, first and foremost, I think the people need to understand and they need to read 374 and find out exactly what that entails. Not just listening to the media and saying, oh, this is pornography and they're trying to bu burn books and those type of things. That is not what 374 does. And we need to understand that it is a responsibility of parents to have an equal voice in that school with the teacher, the principal, the superintendent. We're in this together. We shouldn't be fighting amongst ourselves. Our prime, prime source of concern should be that child and making sure that that child gets the best education possible. 
with the best and finest books that are available to. And I, I have to be perfectly honest, when somebody told me that there was not that there were pornography in the school, I did not believe it. I thought, nope, that's not true. I've been on the school board. I know that's not true. Unfortunately, when I was on the education committee and they brought in brown boxes, brown bags, and you open up those brown bags and there were things that an adult should not witness, or I felt terrible. And I don't think a child should be seeing it. And, but I don't think that um, To Kill a Mockingbird should be put off the shelves. I think we need to be wise. We need to be very selective in what we're doing. We need to have parents involved in the selection of these books. We don't need the far left and we don't need the far right. We need to be moderate and think about what is best for that child. That should be the main concern. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Um, and as we come to uh, the end of our time here, I want to just give you a few moments to give somewhat of a closing statement and, and tell people, um, again, what, what it is that you stand for, and then maybe where they can go to learn more about you or to uh, add some support to your campaign. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm Judy Weeks Roner. My email is jar3762 at aol.com. My uh, website is judy, J-U-D-Y, F-O-R, Utah.com. My phone number is 801-232-6645. I answer it all the time. It's right here. And I answer it. Uh, I, I want it to be perfectly blank. I want the state portion of the food tax removed because not only will, it's going to help the average citizen and we need to do what's best for them too. Uh, the poor, they have their a card that they can get. The rich, they, they're taken care of. We need the working people taken care of. We need good schools. We need good public safety. And I just am looking forward Anybody that has any suggestions, give me a call. I'm willing to listen. And if you disagree with me, we can work to get things even healed. That's me. Well, great. Thanks so much, Judy, for being here. And oh, thank encourage... you for having me. Yeah, of course. It's been a we... great conversation. Yeah, we, we love to highlight our candidates here in the county. And, and so we can hopefully... Uh, send some support your way and and let people know what you're all about so well thank you and if they want to know more they know how to get a hold of me and uh like i say my phone number 801-232-6645 okay. thank you Lovely. have a thanks. good night you guys thanks for being here and uh and by the way we need to talk about uh baseball on our next conversation okay oh sounds good i'm excited right. to hear about it all right see you later Bye. Thanks, Judy. All right, and thanks everyone for sticking here with us. We're gonna wait for just a moment while our next candidate joins and then we'll, we'll dive in.
Okay, and we are back. Thanks to everyone for being here with us tonight. Uh, my name is Joel Gardner. I am a volunteer with the Salt Lake County GOP, um, hosting tonight's uh, Thursday Town Hall. And we are excited to have another candidate with us here tonight, Christina Bodges. She is a candidate for the State School Board District 8. Um, we're excited to, to have you here with us. And just before we dive into talking with you about, about your campaign and, and your platform, I want to remind everyone that these events are made possible because of your donations. So we appreciate that. If you would like to continue to support the county party, you can go to slcogop.com to make a donation. Um, and then if you are interested in asking Christina a question during our conversation, we'd love those questions. You can find the uh, just the comments on YouTube. Uh, that's where you can submit your questions. So um, we'll, we'll check those throughout the, the conversation to make sure that we're addressing any of those, those Q&A items. Um, so Christina, welcome. We want to have you just Tell us a little bit about yourself. Maybe tell us where District 8 is and, and just what made you decide to, to run uh, to, to represent that district. Awesome. Well, District 8 is uh, Taylorsville, West Jordan, um, almost the entirety of West Jordan, uh, Kearns, and a small slice of West Valley City. I think we have six West Valley City precincts. And so I, I tell people, you know, it's, it's West Jordan, Taylorsville, and Kearns. And, and we do have others, uh, but that gives them a good geographic reference for where we're at in District 8. And uh, we have a, a beautiful population of people in our district, and I've really loved meeting them. Uh, as for me, I think first and, and foremost, I'm a mother of three. And uh, I've served for over 21 years in education. I've Honest to goodness, I've probably seen just about everything. I've been in K-12 schools. I've been in cluster modeled schools, potted schools, suburban schools, inner city schools. I served at the secondary level for over a decade and I've served at the elementary for just over that same amount. Um, I've been in thriving schools. We've won first place trophies. We've also experienced uh, focus schools and title one and turnaround schools. So there's, there's this vast, broad experience that comes with a candidate such as myself. And uh, I'm excited to serve the children and the teachers in, in District 8 on the State Board of Education. Great, thank you for that. And if you could tell us just a little bit for those who are maybe more familiar with the local school board, but maybe not as much the state school board, what exactly are the state school board's responsibilities? Well, that is vast. Uh, I, I'm a researcher. And so in the state of Utah, I have found throughout this process, a lot of people don't understand the role and reference of the Utah State Board of Education. So Article 10, Sections 1, 2, and 3 of our Constitution sanction the state school board. It is a powerful agency. They have what are called plenary powers that has been established twice through challenges in the court system. And the Utah Supreme Court has upheld the plenary powers of the Utah State Board of Education. They, they have a kind of a dual role. Um, they have control over the system and they have supervision of the system. And those are two different uh, facets. So if we start with control, that comes with their rulemaking abilities. It comes under the Utah Rulemaking Act. And it is, I know this is exciting stuff. It's just riveting. <laughs> I get excited about it. Uh, so it comes under the Rulemaking Act. They have the authority to rule make even without legislation. In fact, if you look at the rules that they've made in the last uh, even 20 years, there's, a, a, I wouldn't say a ton, but there's a, a good chunk of them that merely cite the Rulemaking Act and the Utah State Constitution as the authority for making that rule. So it is something they have the authority to do, and it is something that they do um more often than some might think. The other way they rule make is when a piece of legislation is passed, it's passed in the legislature and then passed down to the USBE to, to implement into schools. And so that's the control part. The supervision part is their rulemaking um, provides them with the opportunity to set things like effective teacher standards, uh, teacher ethics standards, and then to supervise those standards and then to supervise the compliance 
piece with the, the legislature and state law, kind of an intermediary agency. So they supervise what the legislature says to do. They're the supervisory agency for all your local education agencies. Okay. Sounds like quite, a, quite a, a few different responsibilities. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, no, they, well. they do have other responsibilities. They do manage the state education budget, um, among other things. So it's a, a broad scope. Okay, yeah, and, and wondering from your perspective, what is going right in in Utah schools? Uh, what what should be celebrated about what's going on? Oh gosh, you know so much. Um, in fact, I have a broad a broad uh, viewpoint because I do work in so many institutions, and there's one in my mind right now. I actually just knocked on the principal's door the other day, and I said, I love it here. I love that you see your kids as individuals. I love that you give each child what they need. I love that your teachers get to know your kids. And I really love the culture that you've built here, which is a culture of excellence. It's also a culture of togetherness. And it's a culture of, um, oh, the word escapes me, Joel, but it's it's such a neat place to be where you you get there in the morning and as an educator, you know that you're working with people, not against people. The kids come, they know that every teacher in that building is happy to see them. And it's just a wonderful place to be. And so when you're in a space like that, you can tell something's going right there when we, when we see that. And that just, it super excites me because I know it exists across this state. Mm, absolutely. And, and what are some of in your mind, the major challenges that, that we're facing um, education-wise across the state? Oh, I think that that would be, um, it's another big conversation, right? It can get really hairy really quickly. I think we've got a teacher burnout issue in this state. Uh, I personally have uh, witnessed a vast majority of really, really incredible educators leave this profession. And it makes me sad. Um, we've got a teacher burnout issue, and I think that stems from a variety of things. Um, and one of those things is the public discourse. And, and our state board has been derelict in their duty to manage the public discourse, in my opinion. Uh, we've got teacher burnout because of teacher workload. There has been so much put on their plate that's not even in their job description. And and then when you have teachers in buildings where they don't have good administrative support or where they don't have good collaboration among the staff, it can become very toxic very quickly inside those buildings. And, um, and teachers leave, you know, when you have more than you can handle in a day and you have a boss that doesn't support you, it, it can become very challenging. And as much as people don't like to talk about it, those buildings too exist in the state of Utah. Mm. Yeah, and I'm curious for those who are, aren't in schools every day, what are some of those responsibilities that teachers are being asked to do that are not in their job description? Um, well, let's, let's start with teachers are not social workers and they should not be asked to be social workers. And as much as I champion the idea that we all do our part, there is a great shortage of substitute teachers. And you have teachers that are taking on double time. So you'll see a, a teacher who normally serves a group of 25 or so students. And when another team member is gone, they're serving 40 kids. And it, that's a huge shift. It's a huge shift in responsibility. It's also um, something that, that ruffles the feathers because there's not enough space for that many students in a single space. Um, you know, teachers are also not therapists. They should not be asked to be therapists. And it's, that would be just to name a few. I think there are other things that are considered teacher responsibilities, but we have regulated the classroom so much so that I would love to see um, a new board uh, with fresh eyes really look at teacher workload and how we can streamline things to make it so teachers can do their job well and efficiently because our teachers are smart, they're quick, they're uh, they're well intended, and I, I do believe we really need to take things off their plate that are not their responsibilities, and put things in place so that they can do their job quickly and efficiently. Uh, because everybody benefits, parents benefit, but most specifically, those kids benefit. 
Yeah, and you mentioned the overregulation of the classroom. I'm curious if you can point our listeners to areas in which you feel like regulation has has taken over in the classroom or, or has kind of overstepped um, and, and what you might do to kind of address that. Oh, absolutely. So I think one of the things that uh, I really struggle with as, as an educator is when um, from, from the top down, they say every class should be on the same page at the same time on the same day of the school year. Same, same, same. And, um, and that may not be a state thing, but it can be a district or a network issue. And what happens is teachers know their kids. They know what they're struggling with. They know where their, their gaps in learning are. They, this is what they do. It's how they've refined their skill and honed their craft. And we have teachers who know that their kids need an extra day. And our teachers should be allowed without fear of reprimand to say, my kids need to go over this one more time. We need one more day with this. And so that I would really like to see that teacher autonomy come back into the classroom. I would really love to see the individual um, focus on kids with special needs come back to the classroom. And when I say special needs, I mean unique. I don't mean special education or verified special education. Uh, students with unique needs, they learn in unique ways and teachers should be allowed to teach in a way that reaches those kids without fear of reprimand or reprisal. Mm, okay, so that sounds like there's just like an over systematization of, of the classroom and, and how it flows. And, and so giving teachers a little bit more judgment in, mm -hmm. in, in that schedule and the, and the pace of learning could be really valuable. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's so much to be said for a teacher that just takes a step back and then it's like a freight train. All of a sudden they start going so fast you can't see straight. And it's a beautiful thing to watch a really skilled educator do what they do and do it well. And I, you know, I have three, three wonderful educators in my head right now where I think, man, if the state of Utah could see those wonderful people at work, it would just blow their minds. Hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious that another one of the pillars of your campaign or something that you, you really care about is transparency. And uh, I'm wondering why it is that that's something that's top of your list and, and what is it that we could do to increase transparency um, and what, what you could do on the board to do that? Well, I think when we talk about transparency, I really specifically mean the State Board of Education. And the, the State Board, uh, they have a lot of lip service in transparency but I see people struggle with, I didn't know this was going on. And some of that is an unengaged citizen. We have to be fair and sporting in our assessment. But I would challenge any of the listeners to go to schools.utah.gov and find the board agenda. And then I would challenge you to read it in fewer than seven days. And that to me is, is a twofold problem. One, we're not being purposefully transparent with the public when we don't put it front and center in a place where they can find it without having to search for it. Secondly, if it is so much information that, that a, an educated individual couldn't read it in five or six hours, I would, I would think that maybe the public might think we're hiding something. And, and so I think there needs to be a purposeful movement on behalf of the Utah State Board of Education to engage the public in a way that is um, so honest, so boldly honest that no one could accuse them of not being transparent. I, I would also love to see public comment time expanded. Uh, we have 3.21 million people in this state. Last I checked, it could have changed, but, uh, 30 minutes of public comment time for 3.21 million people seems a little shy for me. Uh, I also, I, I genuinely believe that if, if our board cared about what teachers thought, perhaps public comment wouldn't be while teachers worked. And so that interchange of discourse and that transparency between those who are on the front lines getting the job done and your state board should be bold and it should be purposeful coming from the top down. Mm. It's interesting because teachers, you know, education is a profession where clarity and understandability are so, so important and, you know, succinctness so that you can get the message across to the, to hear that the, the agenda is, you know, thousands of pages long. Uh, I don't know, like, 
what's what's in there and why why is it so long and and what could be done to make it more clear or more you know succinct oh i think many things could be done one is uh, you know the board manages a a seven billion dollar budget and they get one meeting a month i think one thing the board could do is maybe say we should be meeting more and then those board packets should should obviously, you know, by mathematical, if we meet twice a month, they should be half as long. And then the committees meet on the second day of board meetings. Uh, but I, I do believe there are things that the board can be very purposeful in, in ensuring that the public is engaged, the public has time, and that they too have the time to go through that packet with a fine tooth comb to ensure that we're doing the best by our students, our teachers, and our parents in this state. I, I just think it's important that that we can do that. And having more meetings, I think, would be a good first step. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm curious about uh, just improving academics generally. I know there there's a, a troubling number of high school students who leave not achieving uh, standards for math and reading and science. And I, I'm wondering what you think that you could do on the state school board to help improve students' academic performance? I would love to champion policies that really reduce the redundancy in our system, the complexity of the Utah state education system, and ultimately the dysfunction that would allow teachers to teach. We, we have a, a, a tight grip on our educators right now. And as much as we need great teacher autonomy, we need great teacher accountability. And if we find a good balance and we allow our local agencies to exercise that balance, I really believe we're gonna see something where our teachers can teach. And nothing is more beautiful than watching an unleashed teacher go at it. And, and when I say unleashed, I don't mean unhinged. I mean, unleashed where they go and do their job well. It's a really beautiful thing to see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I've been the beneficiary of many great and unleashed teachers in my life. So I, yeah. I, I can attest to that. Yeah, um, me too. Well, well, we're getting to uh, near the end of our time here. I'm wondering if you could just give us a, a summary again of, you know, what, what has... Uh, driven you to, to want to run for this, this office and, and uh, kind of who you are and, and where people can learn more and, and uh, find out more information about how to support your campaign. Awesome. Well, to learn more, I would go to CB, the number four, ut.com, and you'll find a lot about me. You'll find out I've been in this business for 21 years. I've served in all sorts of capacities. Uh, I have uh, multiple degrees, post-baccalaureate degrees. I'm pursuing a doctorate degree. You're going to find out things um, about what I stand for, things that are important to me as we move forward. Uh, everything from, um, uh, you know, unleashing our teachers to do their jobs to uh, the Fourth Amendment, the right to privacy inside our schools. I, I, I really do value uh, the First and Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution, and those are things that I would like to champion as, as we move forward. Um, you're going to find out that I ran for, for many reasons. Uh, one is the communication. I, I approached the board many times, and specifically my uh, representative, and I didn't get any, any response. And so I, I diligently try uh, to respond to people who connect with me, and, and if I don't, I ask them to, hey, try twice, because maybe that text message got lost. It wasn't purposeful. I really do engage with people. And, um, and I'm running for, I say for many reasons, but they're so vast, Joel, that, that I could go on for days. There is a desperate need for someone on the front lines in there to be talking about real-time issues that we face every day. And, uh, and not someone with a narrow scope of experience, not someone with, with a narrow mindset. Um, if you look at my credentials, I'm credentialed in business, in history, in social studies, in econ. I'm credentialed in the general education elementary classroom. And, and those are things where I bring this broad view of 
of what our teachers are experiencing and how we need to make policies and champion policies that first and foremost allows our teachers to teach. Well, thank you, Christina. Thank you for running and, and for being with us tonight. Uh, we encourage those who are interested to go to your website to learn more about you and, you. and to find ways to support you. So, Awesome. Um, thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, Christina. Have a good night. You too. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining tonight. We will look forward to seeing you next Thursday for our next yeah, establishment or uh, yeah, and next iteration of our Thursday Town Hall series.